It is written in the scriptures that we should journey to Jerusalem three times a year. We are going up to the city of God, to Jerusalem, to celebrate. The Lord told the children of Israel to honor seven holy celebrations each year involving three journeys to Jerusalem. Each festival would be uniquely fulfilled in the coming of the Messiah. The holy days of our Lord, shadows of things to come. Shalom and welcome to Zola Levitt Presents. I'm Miles, this is my wife Catherine, and we are in the series, The Holy Days of Our Lord, Shadows of Things to Come. Wow, we are now about to learn about the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. And it's really, it's the last of the seven feasts, not the end of our series, but the last of the feasts, and it really is about the culmination of all things, isn't it? And the Jews, they actually make a booth, mm -hmm. and they, it's to remind them that our life here is temporal, that we're sojourners, that we're just passing through, mm -hmm. and so we're to keep a light touch on yes. how much we focus on this earth. Exactly, and it really looks forward to the time when Yeshua will come and tabernacle with man as Emmanuel, God with us. So it's it's a wonderful feast, so let's go right away to our founder, Zola Levitt, taught, teaching 10 years ago in Israel, right now. The 15th day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles. Take for yourselves the beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Shalom, hello again. Well, we came to the wilderness outside of Jerusalem to talk about the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, the road in the picture back there is the road right up into Jerusalem. And otherwise, right outside of the town is real desert, like the desert of the wilderness that the chosen people went through. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles is the last one, the seventh one in Leviticus uh, 23, 34, or 33, it says, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. And it goes on with various observances, and in verse 42, Ye shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. Well, this is an odd translation. The word is Sukkot in Hebrew, tents, tabernacles like this one. Uh, they found materials in the wilderness as they traveled those 40 years that uh, uh, was, were provided by God. The idea that he provides for his people in the wilderness is very important because the wilderness in the whole feast story stands for this life that we're leading in this world. It works this way. The symbols from Passover teach us that the bitter herbs at the table uh, represent the bitterness of slavery. That's our lives before we were saved. Then comes the blood of the lamb, uh, the way they got out in the Exodus. Uh, that is our salvation. Of course, we are also saved from, from bondage by the blood of the lamb. Then they went in the Red Sea and came out again safely as we go into the waters of baptism and come out again safely. And then what do we do but travel in this wilderness? But God provides as we travel in this life. He said he would, and with his chosen people for 40 years, he provided material like this. Quail flew over, they ate, they, they, they survived, and they wandered. And uh, uh, this is very symbolic for us. The history of the thing, it's the third major encounter they've had with the Lord as a nation. You see, before uh, the Exodus, before he uh, talked through Moses and to the people about uh, uh, getting out of Egypt, he had only talked to one person at a time, to Adam, to Noah, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Uh, but now he's talking to a nation, and he talked to the nation at Passover with this tremendous Exodus. And then uh, uh, he talked to them at Pentecost, so to say, which uh, is the uh, traditional giving of the law from Sinai. That is uh, what the rabbis hold. And now Tabernacle's the third major encounter of God talking 
to the whole nation. It symbolizes the end of the harvest for the year. Everything is in, everything has been harvested. Uh, the people have bountiful uh, gifts from the, the, the promised land that God has made fertile. And uh, the thing is uh, usually in October, on the Hebrew calendar, Tishri, 15 to 21. Uh, that is roughly starts, give or take, mid-September or so, maybe a little later, and typically a tabernacles after that in October. It's the happiest feast. It's the kingdom feast. Uh, you know, it'll be celebrated in the kingdom to come. Zechariah 14, 16 says, All those nations which came up against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the Lord and to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. They'll all come to Jerusalem for a thousand years to celebrate this feast. Probably the other feasts will be celebrated too, but this one specifically is noted in Scripture to be celebrated by name. Of course, at Passover, when the Lord set down his uh, wine goblet, he said, I'll not drink of this wine till I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom, indicating we'd uh, drink Passover wine with him or have Passover. But tabernacles is given by name. These booths will survive. And the idea is the Lord's tabernacle, the, the, the house of God will be rebuilt in Jerusalem and occupied by the king and uh, uh, will be with him as the queen of the kingdom to come. So uh, the, the grand feast of tabernacles is that thousand years uh, living in his tabernacle in effect. Well, the, uh, the Israelites dwell in these Sukkot, these booths, these, these tents, seven days. They teach their children the story of how they were sustained in the wilderness. Some just take meals, some stay overnight. But God says all that are Israelites born will dwell in booths. And uh, there's a wonderful celebration uh, there was at the temple, there is at the synagogues today, uh, a pouring of water for one thing. Uh, this is uh, about uh, uh, the high priest taking water from the pool of Siloam, which is uh, down the southern end of the uh, hill of, uh, below the temple and uh, gathering water from there and pouring a basin at the foot of the altar in a grand ceremony. Josephus, a uh, first century historian, said, if you haven't seen this celebration, you've never seen a festival celebration. It was so grand. Uh, they encircled the altar seven times. Uh, they, they beat with willow branches. The lighting of the temple was four gigantic uh, candelabras, uh, uh, four huge uh, lights uh, with so so much uh, uh, flame coming out of them that it said every courtyard throughout Jerusalem was lit through the night uh, by those candelabra. Uh, the Lord covers it in the Psalms and says it's about the pillar of fire that was uh, out there in the wilderness. That is what they are remembering. The pouring of water remembers Moses striking the rock and God providing water for his people. And so a grand celebration to mark this happiest feast we might call it kind of their festival of Thanksgiving. For insightful perspectives of Israel and Bible prophecy, ask for our free monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter. When you call, be sure to ask for our free catalog with the latest videos, books, and music. Our correspondence course, the Institute for Jewish Christian Studies includes reading packets, teaching CDs, and mail-in tests. You may want to join us on an upcoming tour of Israel or Petra, or cruise the Mediterranean visiting Greece and Ephesus. Please contact us for more information. That's Israel. We love it. You will love it. We want you to come with us. We know you'll have a life-changing time with us. And we know that there's so much that you are wanting to look into Israel. So we want to share it with you. It's true. Zola said that 
Going to Israel is like 10 years in Sunday school. It really is. Great way to stay in touch with us is through the Levitt letter. You can receive it by getting in touch with us. It's free to you at levitt.com. And this week's offer is the Holy Days of Our Lord, the very series that we're watching that Zola produced over 10 years ago. It's full of information and full of revelation about the days of our Lord, the Feast of the Lord. So now let's get back to Zola on location. Traditionally, there are four species of building materials that God somehow laid around the, the Sinai, around the desert as they wandered. Uh, there was the etrog and the citron and, and different fruits and branches, palm branches and so on, which they needed to uh, build the Sukkot and to trim them out uh, to make them decent for habitation. They were always to be found even in empty desert. I don't know if you've seen the Sinai or the Judean desert or the, the wilderness of Sin or any of these places where they went, but uh, they're not friendly deserts. They're not for beginners. And yet the whole nation, old people, children, uh, everyone survived and uh, God saw to it. Now that wandering sort of answers to a long summer. You know, the, the feasts are planned with three in the spring, more or less in April. Those are, uh, of course, Passover, unleavened bread and first fruits. Then we skip 50 days and we have Pentecost. That's late May, early June. But then there's the long summer and it goes all the way over to the fall feasts in the seventh month of the year, which is more or less September, and finally ending with tabernacles, uh, usually in October. And so uh, Jeremiah says in, in Jeremiah 8, 20, a, a, a very telling verse, the summer is over, the harvest is past, and we're not yet saved. Uh, this is a, a cry out, it seems almost to modern Israel. It's just about over. The harvest is about to finish. The trumpet's going to sound. That's the first fall feast. That would be the rapture. And uh, only the saved are going in that one. It, it would be a tragedy if Israel is unsaved still at that point. Now, at Tabernacles, the Lord did some of his most basic teachings. In John 7, uh, uh, his brothers tempt him to go down. You know, they're, they're almost teasing him. Uh, you know, you do some uh, a public relations for your ministry. You're the Savior. Go down there to Jerusalem and tell them. I mean, they really didn't uh, uh, hold to the teachings of their older brother. Uh, and, and almost like uh, Joseph's brothers, just, just refused to bow to the one whom God was inspiring. But he went down to the temple and he taught, and he taught beautifully. He taught about uh, the light of the world. Uh, in John 9, 5, he says, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And also in John 8, 12, the same, uh, the uh, thousand year reign, uh, he taught of that, uh, the kingdom. Uh, it's it's a, a magnificent teachings that he gave at the Feast of Tabernacles. He really disclosed some magnificent things. Uh, John 4.10 is uh, about salvation. This is when he was uh, witnessing to the Samaritan woman. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Uh, <laughs> it was told to me by Dr. Charles Ryrie, author of the Study Bible, that the one verse here is the most perfect of all witnesses. It has four elements what he told her. If thou knewest the gift of God, so salvation is a free gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink. So if you know the Savior, if you know the Messiah, you must know the right, the valid Messiah. Uh, thou wouldest ask of him, you must ask for this salvation, it's not automatic, and he would have given thee living water. He gives it freely. Uh, this is so perfect, uh, another teaching of the Lord that is, that is so wonderful. You know, his name was salvation. You know, it, 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 Yeshua, the name, in, uh, Jesus' name in Hebrew, Yeshua means salvation. That's, that's the word for salvation. So the verse that says that Mary called his name Yeshua, salvation, because he brings his people salvation makes sense. If we have the name Jesus, which is a transliteration from the Greek, then you don't get it. It's, he called his name Jesus because he brought his people salvation. Doesn't mean anything. But if we know his true name, it, it does mean a, a great deal. 
Well, during Tabernacles, Jesus uh, amplified these things magnificently. He taught of the light of the world. He taught of living water. He taught of the, uh, the, the word made flesh uh, subtleties. He, he also uh, disclosed that the Holy Spirit was coming, verses 37 to 39. And uh, oh, if you read just John 7, it's a wonderful, wonderful chapter. And uh, he taught that uh, he was God among the people. You know, when you go back to the beginning of the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, in Exodus 25, God first tells the people to gather the materials. They had plenty of stuff from Egypt. Uh, the Egyptians uh, <laughs> bid them goodbye and good riddance, and they gave them uh, uh, gold and silver and, and, and linens and, and all kinds of things uh, that they took with them in the Exodus because, after all, after 10 plagues, they were just glad to see them go, and whatever they needed, they gave them. And uh, God said to bring those materials. They say the women gave the bronze from uh, the mirrors in those days were polished bronze. And in a, a very uh, wonderful gift, the women took their bronze mirrors and handed them in to be melted down to make the, the bronze laver of water for the front of the tabernacle. That was quite a, quite a gift. But in Exodus 25, 8, God tells the purpose of the whole thing. He says to take those materials and let them make a sanctuary that I might dwell among my people. That is magnificent that, that uh, God is going to dwell with his people. I mean, look, there were other tribes in the Sinai with other gods. The Egyptians had a lot of gods. You know, they had their magicians consulting all sorts of false gods. But nobody claimed their God lived with them. They looked to heaven. They looked to statues. They looked to valleys. They looked to mountains. But nobody said he's right over in the tent. That's his apartment on earth. He created this whole world, and he lives here among us because we're his chosen people. Well, Jesus in, in, in that wonderful chapter uh, teaching at the Feast of Tabernacles teaches the Word made flesh, God dwelling among His people, the whole idea of the tabernacle. Uh, in practice, uh, the earthly body that we have is this tabernacle, uh, that the tabernacle of the Spirit, and uh, we need to, to care for it. We need to treat it well. Second Corinthians 5, 1 says, For if we know that our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. When we die, uh, this, this tabernacle is no good anymore. We have another tabernacle up there in heaven to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord, Paul taught. And uh, we, we simply await either our death, uh, it, which is, <laughs> gee, I remember watching an old uh, Yiddish movie, a Jewish movie called Hester Street, uh, really made in America, but about the people that came over from Europe uh, at, uh, before the turn of the century. Very poor, from very religious communities of Jews in Europe. They started out on the east side of New York, and uh, they made uh, little businesses. They worked in sweatshops and so on. But there was a touching scene where a letter came from the old country, and uh, the hero in the story uh, takes it to a rabbi who can read and asks him what it says. And the rabbi looks at it, looks deeply at the man, and says, your father has been freed, uh, meaning that he, his earthly body was gone and he has been freed. So when we're freed, we're going to, uh, to heaven, to, to the Lord, and then back here to rule this earth with the Lord. And so the magnificent spiritual song by Isaac Watts, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king, and he rules the world. He makes the nations prove. Teaching on tabernacles is so rich because it really speaks about God and man coming together, God with us, tabernacling. It's a wonderful teaching about the impermanence of our life and our need to meet with the one who made us. Some supporters of Israel are some of the greatest people that we've met. There are Christian Zionists, people who believe in Israel, who stand with the Jewish people. Among them is the International Christian Embassy. Back when this was recorded, we were able to get an interview with the International Christian Embassy, and this interview will really bless you. So let's go there on location right now. Chuck King, thanks for being with us today. Thank you. Uh, can you give us some background to the Christian Embassy and, and what its purpose is here in Jerusalem? Certainly. The Christian Embassy is actually coming up on its uh, 20th anniversary. It began out of a vision in 1980 from a group of uh, believers who were here 
that had a heart to celebrate the, the Feast of Tabernacles. That happened in 1980 at the Anglican School here. There were about a thousand Christians that came. And from that celebration, that first celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles, the ministry of the International Christian Embassy began. Out of a biblical um, mandate to love and comfort Israel, the Jewish people, and also to stand in solidarity with Jerusalem as the undivided capital of this nation. Well, Chuck, do you think that the church today has a, a true understanding of what the Feast of Tabernacles is, is really about? I don't know if specifically they have an understanding of the Feast of Tabernacles, but I do think there is a growing awareness in the church about our responsibility towards Israel and the connection that the church has, the prophetic connection that the church has and the responsibility towards Israel and why we should be involved. And how would you define that responsibility? Well, because um, our faith has grown out of the tree. We are, we're the branches of the tree that Paul described. Um, our Messiah comes from this nation. The, the book that we place our faith in comes from this nation. And really, um, because of those things and also because of the historical um, events that have happened where the church, I believe, has responsibility for the anti-Semitism throughout the ages. We have a responsibility to actually um, restore the relationship and show uh, what our faith is uh, truly about, and that is one people under one God. Well, Chuck, what exactly does the Christian Embassy do during the Feast of Tabernacles? Well, the Feast of Tabernacles is an event that uh, attracts approximately 5,000 believers from all over the world. And the, the main emphasis, I think, of the Feast of Tabernacles is worship. You know, it's a, it's a biblical feast that uh, is a feast of remembrance to think of, about the way that God was with the children of Israel as they traveled through the desert and to come and tabernacle with the Lord. And of course, we're anticipating uh, the, the reign of the Messiah when He comes and when all nations will gather to celebrate the Feast of the Lord. But uh, I'd say that the main thing about the Feast of Tabernacles is praise and worship. Uh, we have a, a choir, uh, a dance company, an orchestra, and these are members of the feast team that are recruited from all over the world. Uh, many nations represented in the, the music team itself. And it's just a spectacular event where we incorporate the arts. Uh, and really, it's a, it's a way that we can say to Israel, we're coming to worship with you. And this is the way that we want to do it with a multicultural kind of expression, different musical styles as well. Not only that, but we have uh, teaching seminars throughout the day. We offer uh, many opportunities for the pilgrims that come to experience Israel in a unique kind of way. We participate in the Jerusalem March, which uh, is, is a big uh, event here in the city. Uh, actually, the feast pilgrims occupy about 50% of the space now in the Jerusalem March, where the pilgrims come and march in their national costumes. Also, tree planting. We have the Christian Embassy has two uh, tree forests now, over 50,000 trees that uh, Christians have planted uh, to help build, rebuild Zion, uh, visits to Yad Vashem and various other sites. Also, we have a desert celebration, the Erev Sukkot, the first night of the feast, where we take the, the pilgrims to a site right next to the Dead Sea and give them a taste of what it, would like, what it was like for the pilgrims that were wandering through the wilderness on their way um, to the land of Israel. That's how we begin Sukkot. That's great. Well, how does the Jewish community receive your celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles? I think they're, they're overwhelmingly supportive and, and favorable towards us. You can see that definitely when you participate in the Jerusalem March because the Israelis are lining the streets and it's such an overwhelming uh, realization for them that there are Christians in, in the world that love and care about this country and, and want to do something in support uh, for them. So I think it's very well received. And actually, we have uh, one of the nights of the Feast of Tabernacles is specifically dedicated for our Isra the Israeli co uh, community to come and to celebrate with us. So, th and they do come. There are some within the body of Christ, the believers, the church, who will look at the Old Testament and say that it's old. That they would look at Leviticus 23, for instance, and say that the feasts really have no significance today. Uh, what would you say to those people? Well, I think that if, we, if we're Christians, 
uh, that means that we're follow followers of Jesus, we're followers of Yeshua, and we want to do what our Master did. The feasts of, of Israel were given as perpetual feasts of remembrance, although the, there isn't a, a great understanding now of what the feasts are all about. That doesn't mean that we can't learn about them and, and learn about what their significance is for us because they do reveal God's plan and God's character and His nature. so wonderful to hear Zola playing the music that he loved in the land that he loved. It's, there's nothing quite like it. You know, this Feast of Tabernacles really is the culmination of all seven feasts, and it speaks about God coming together with man, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's the tabernacling of God with man, mm -hmm. but it's also a remembrance that our life is temporal. Mm -hmm. And I loved it when we put up a tabernacle in the, our backyard, yep. a booth, as they call it, mm -hmm. a temporary dwelling. Yes. We used the seven species, yep. and we had a great time inviting right. people over and sharing what the, the Word says about this holiday. Right. I mean, Jesus kept every one of these miles, he, and he did. we should too. Yeah, we would do it all. We'd have uh, the high priest ceremony pouring out the water, which is when Jesus said that, I, anyone who thirsts, come to me, you'll never thirst again. You know, we, we um, had such a great time of opening our home in that way and our hearts in that way. It's really, the, the Hebrew concept is ushpizin. It's about the welcoming or the hospitality of anyone who wants to come into the tabernacle. And it really looks forward to John 3.16, which preaches to us that whosoever will can come and drink from the waters of life. Whosoever will is welcome to come to draw from the wells of salvation. And that's really the story of the feast, isn't it, about who Yeshua is. And so, until we see you again, we want to say Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our offer on this program, The Holy Days of Our Lord, given by Moses on Mount Sinai. These celebrations comprise one of the most fascinating studies of biblical types and shadows. The series of 11 half-hour programs is on three DVDs and features the teaching of Zola Levitt on location in Israel. This is a wonderful overview of the festivals of the Lord established for the chosen people in Leviticus 23. Ask for the DVD series, The Holy Days of Our Lord. Also, please call toll-free or write to receive our monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter. It's absolutely free and contains insightful article and news commentary with a refreshing perspective you won't get from the mainstream media. The Levitt Letter is also available at levitt.com, along with current and archived TV programs, our national airing schedule, and much more. Please remember Zola Levitt Ministries depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. This has been a paid program. Brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministries.